Well, God bless you. Welcome to the wonderful Words of Life radio program. We are going to be in a very exciting chapter, Romans chapter 8, the conclusion of everything Paul has written to the Roman church about, beginning in chapter 1 all the way up to present. So Romans chapter 8, very exciting chapter. It is the conclusion of all that Paul has uh, written to the Roman church about, and this is a very exciting chapter, the conclusion of the sanctification of the Spirit and living in the Spirit. Amen. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we're, we'll be looking into the law of the Spirit of life in this chapter. But before we begin, let's just go ahead and pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that comes alongside of us to help us in this ministry today. And we give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, beginning in verse 1 of Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Notice here that... Take this verse of Scripture and compare it to the 25th verse of chapter 7. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is no judgment of eternal death in behalf of those who are born again. How do we know we're born again? Well, we know we have the witness that we are in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. What was the law of sin and death? It was the law of Moses. We tried so desperately to live by the law of Moses, but failed. The ten, we're speaking specifically of the Ten Commandments. We failed. Every time we tried when we were in the flesh, we failed to live by the Ten Commandments. So the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that is the principle. That is the authority that we have now in our new life in Christ Jesus. And this authority is based upon our faith in the work of Christ. And this law, notice the, the law of the spirit of life. Paul calls this a law. A law is something that works all the time it is put into practice. So this is what we're being governed now by. We're being governed by the law of the spirit of life, not by the law of sin and death. Verse 3, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Amen. We are no longer under condemnation. Sin was condemned. We were sinners and we were under that condemnation, but now we're no longer sinners. We are born again. We are saved. Amen. And we have the life and the nature of God on the inside of us. So we are not condemned. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul says this in verse 4, that the righteousness of the law, talking about the law of Moses, might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The only way for us to fulfill the law, it has to be done through the Spirit, through the born-again experience. For they that are after the flesh... Do mind the things of the flesh. Actually, we could say it this way, for they that are after the flesh put the mind to the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit put the mind to the things of the Spirit. That's actually what the Greek word uh, phroneo means, do mind. For they that are after the flesh do mind is the Greek word phroneo, and it literally means put the mind to. Now, verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, carnally minded is death comes from the Greek word phronusine, and it means to bend the will, the bending of the will towards sinfulness. 
as a slave to unrighteousness. And this, we become, we became slaves to unrighteousness. It was by our will and by our choice. It's because death that was working in us. But see, this no longer applies to us. There is a higher law that we are governed by, and that is we are spiritually minded. And this is where we should be. Spiritually minded is life and peace. Let me read this verse again. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We are now ruled by the the gift of righteousness. We're ruled by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Verse 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. This is our state before we were born again. We were actually in opposing forces against God and against his word. But that's not true any longer. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. When we're talking about uh, being in the flesh, we're talking about our pre-Christian experience. Not as believers now, but before we became believers. See, this is the great handicap of the lower self that is in bondage to sin. It cannot please God. And then verse 9, Paul reassures the writers, I mean the the, uh, church at Rome and to us, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, let's take this verse of scripture. Let's take it apart. But ye are not in the flesh. This forms the conclusion of Paul's argument in chapter 7. Born-again believers are not sold under sin any longer. We are not slaves to the nature of sin. We are in the Spirit. And this means that we are in union with Christ through the new birth. And this great mystery is God working in us to will and to do His good pleasure. We are now part of God's pleasure. We are part of God's kingdom that is redeemed. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in us. Well, we know that that's the first action of the new birth. The Holy Spirit comes into us. Amen. And makes us brand new persons inside. We're translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, and Paul finishes this verse by saying this, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What does that mean? That means religious people that don't have the spirit of Christ don't belong to Christ. Water baptized people that don't have the spirit of Christ in them, they're not part of Christ. Religious people, moral people, moral people that don't have the spirit of Christ in them, they do not own Christ. In other words, Christ does not own them. They have no no part in the kingdom of God and of the Savior. That's why people need to be born again. You may be a religious person listening to this broadcast. You may think that you're moral enough to get to heaven. I'm telling you, without Christ, you're not going to make it. Christ will not claim you if you are not in him. God will not claim you if you're not in Christ. Let me read verse 9 again. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. This is why the word of God tells us you must be born again. That's how you become a part of the spirit of Christ. Verse 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 10, a powerful verse. If Christ be in you, in other words, if if you and I are born again, the body is now dead because of sin. The nature of sin has been rendered powerless. It doesn't dominate or control our nature any longer. What controls our nature? The spirit of life because of righteousness. We have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Praise God. That is such a powerful statement. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him 
that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. The born again believers identification with Christ is in his death and burial and resurrection. That's where we find our place in God. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Our flesh problems. The Holy Spirit quickens our mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in us. There is a new power. There is a new dominion. There is a new government on the inside of us that shows us, that teaches us that we are to deny godly lust. The new birth gives us assurance and that assurance will culminate in the resurrection of the saints. That our corruption will become incorruptible and our mortality will become immortal. And all of this is accomplished through the Holy Spirit that has been given unto us. Now, let's talk about adoption. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. We are not debtors to the flesh. What are we debtors to? Well, we're debtors to the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We don't, as servants, we don't obey. We are not to obey the dictates of the flesh. We are to obey the Holy Spirit that leads us to eternal life, the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus that we're justified by. We are not to the flesh. We're not to live after the flesh. Our spiritual condition, this is, this is the way we were before we were saved. But now God has granted us new birth. And our former life was dead in trespasses and sins. But now we are no longer dead in trespasses and sins. We are alive in Christ Jesus. And it's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that is at work in us, propelling us to do the things that are pleasing unto God. Verse 13 tells us, for if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, we shall live. And once again, Paul is contrasting the former sinful life before we came to Christ, opposed to the life that we enjoy now. We no longer live after the flesh. Why? Because we're born again. We're saved. We live after what? We live after the Spirit. We live for Christ. And it's through the Holy Spirit that we mortify the deeds of the body. The things we enjoyed doing, the drinking, the smoking, the dancing, all of that carousing we enjoyed before we got saved. Now that we're born again, all that has been mortified. All that's been put to death. And the things in our flesh that we carried over from the netherworld, uh, that are, they're constantly being brought out into the open and put to death. God is marching us on to perfection Ha <laughs> ha, glory to God. Oh, that is so, so exciting. Verse 14 then says, For then as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Are we being led by the Spirit of God? It's because we are the sons of God. Saved people are led by the Spirit of God. They are not led by the Spirit of this world. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Paul tells us in writing to the Galatians that all born again believers have been adopted into the kingdom of Christ. And because they've been adopted into God's kingdom, they have had bestowed upon them all the rights and the privileges of the firstborn son. That is the whole idea, the whole tenor behind adoption. Amen. Praise God. Verse 16 says, for the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit 
that we are the children of God. John said it this way. He that believeth that Jesus is the son of God has the witness in himself. It's the Holy Spirit that bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We could, we could say it this way, that we are born again, that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. Now, very exciting verse, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We are heirs of God, not just heirs, but joint heirs, equal heirs. We are sitting together in our position in God. We are sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And, and Peter reminds us in his first epistle, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, that our inheritance is reserved in heaven for us. Now, we have an inheritance here. Our full inheritance will be up there. Well, now somebody might ask, well, what about sufferings in this world? Why do we suffer? Well, Paul addresses that beginning in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this pleasant present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There is a greater glory coming. We have glory in us now in the presence of God that is in us. There is a greater glory coming. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. The entire creation is earnestly waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, speaking just not of the rapture, but towards the end of the tribulation period, the manifestation of the sons of God in the millennium. The whole creation will be regenerated, just like you and I are seeds of the regeneration. Jesus called the millennial reign of Christ in the time of regeneration. And he said this, Behold, I make all things new. Oh, I tell you, this regeneration began with the church. Actually, it began with Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. But the, the physical result of on earth of what took place uh, through the redemption of Christ was the birth of the church. This is the beginning of the regeneration. You're not part of a generation. You're part of the regeneration. It begins with us. What a powerful, powerful word. Verse 21 says this, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. You and I were delivered from the bondage of corruption, the law of sin and death, through the new birth. Now, the creation itself is eagerly awaiting deliverance from the bondage of corruption and entering into the glorious liberty of the children of God. This is a glorious liberty, believer. And if you're not born again, you don't know anything about what I'm talking about. Not until you repent of sin, ask Christ to come into your heart and life and get born again. Then you understand what Paul is talking about here. Amen. Praise God. Let's read that verse again. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Think about this world. Think about the corruption that's in this world. All that will be delivered. Not only will we be delivered from it, but the entire creation will be delivered from it. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. That's what we're waiting on. Our spirit has been redeemed. It has been saved. 
Our mind, will, and emotions are in the process of being saved. We are reaching spiritual maturity. We are reaching forward unto Christian perfection. That will take place the redemption of our body. When this corruption will put on incorruption, this mortality will put on immortality. And we pass through the fire of the judgment seat of Christ and we will be made perfect. We will be saved, thoroughly saved in all of our works. The gold, silver and the precious jewels that we've uh, collected down here on earth as trophies, all of that will be purified. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? So what, what is Paul talking about here? Well, we're saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. We, what are we hoping? We hope. We know because of what God has done on the inside of us that he is going to finish the work. Amen. We're not trusting any longer in the past sins of the flesh. We're not trusting in the, the rudiments of this world, the elemental spirits of this world. We're trusting in the Holy Spirit who dwells on the inside of us. This gives us great hope. Jesus is the blessed hope. Our hope is found in him. Our hope, our confident expectation that what God has begun, he will finish. And so this is why we trust in him every day. We trust in him. Now, verse 26. Let's talk about our helper for just a moment. Likewise, the spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He literally comes alongside of us. He takes hold together with us against these infirmities, these inabilities to get results. And what does he do? He prays all things. Notice verse 27. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God, according to the perfect will of God. This is who we have as a helper. He's the one that causes us to triumph and to overcome. Intercession then becomes something that he does on our behalf in conjunction with us working towards the will, the perfect will of God. And he helps us to accomplish it. We, there's a lot of things we can't do on our own. But when we pray and when God designs to do something, he communicates that to his children and we pray. And when we pray, God begins to clear the way for the answer to come. So this is why we never give up prayer. Jesus told us never to quit when it comes to prayer. Verse 28, and we know that all things, notice that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You mean even suffering works together for our good? Well, if we don't quit, it will. There is suffering in this life. We know that. We've experienced it. But we hold on to God. We hope in God. We hold on to his promises. And we know that with the Holy Spirit's help, working through our prayer life and our life will make all things work out for our good. That's a powerful statement of Paul. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He planned beforehand. He had you in mind. Beforehand, way beforehand. Before Jesus ever came to this earth, God had already predestined you to salvation in Christ Jesus. And this salvation included to be conformed to the image of his son. Oh, wow, that's powerful. That is so powerful. Verse 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the glory of the end time story when we are completely glorified. He chose us. He called us to him. 
And when we came in answer to faith and answer to the God, to, to the gospel, he declared us not guilty through Christ. And he filled us with God's goodness. Amen. Gave us right standing with him. And he promised us glory. Wow, what a glorious end time story. Amen. Verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Christ is the pledge that God gave to us for the redemption of the, not just us, but for the redemption of the entire world, that all men might be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, all men will, this is God's heart, his desire. But now all men have to answer this call. And for all those who have received Christ, it is God's good pleasure to give to them the kingdom of God. Wow, what a tremendous promise in the scriptures. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God the father would not dishonor his son, not in the absolute least. He gave us his son. And we received his son. We received the work that Jesus did on the cross. And now God is going to continue that giving by giving us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies that right now. That shuts the mouth of the devil. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who was even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. We have God interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you see what an exalted position that we have been made to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? <laughs> Do you see what an exalted position God has placed us? We who were in total destruction, God has raised us up. And now he's given us total life. Life is God has it. Zoe life. What a tremendous promise. Father, we bless you. We thank you today for your goodness and for your mercy. Help us to carry this. And Lord, to every person listening to this broadcast, if they haven't made Jesus Christ Savior and Lord, Father, I pray right now through the power of the Holy Spirit that they reach out to you and claim Christ as their Savior today. And Lord, we'll give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, that you would be prepared for heaven? If you're not sure, then I encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Father God, I come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. I repent and ask you to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I surrender my heart and life to you. By faith, I believe I receive you as my Lord and Savior, and I thank you for receiving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed this prayer and desire to know more about the gift of Christ that the Heavenly Father offers you, then email us at rbtc86 at gmail.com. We will be glad to answer your questions promptly and provide you at your request with materials that will help you to grow in your faith in the Lord Jesus. 
This is Patsy Dunning. Thank you for listening to our broadcast today. And let me remind you to tune in to this station at the same time next week to hear more of the wonderful words of life. God bless you and remember what Jesus said. It is the Spirit who gives life.